He came for your wounds. To show you what love sees. When love looks at you. We need that reminder, don't we? We're grateful that you're here today to receive that reminder. Understand that there are people occupying every square inch of our building for this reminder. So we send greetings to those of you in all of the overflow rooms asking that God's power, God's love, and God's presence speak personally to each one of you. We can so easily forget that God is writing a story, a unique, never-before-written story on each one of our lives. We get so sucked down in the details of the day, the humdrum, the busyness, the coming and the going, the bill paying and the boss pleasing, all the activities of life that we forget that God is up to something grand in each of our lives with no exception. Life has so many starts and stops and fits and turns. We have a cemetery sharing the same block as a playground. We we have weddings sharing the same calendar with funerals. We, we, we look for a storyline that's threading all of these days together and, and it can be so confusing. And if the confusion's not bad enough, what about the conclusion? We die. This heart, unless Christ comes first, is going to have one final heartbeat. This hand is going to fall limp. These lungs are going to exhale one final time. We we all die. No one escapes death. Death, one man said, is the most democratic institution on earth. It allows no discrimination. It tolerates no exceptions. The mortality rate of mankind is the same the world over. One death per person. Or as the psalmist asked, What man can live and not see death? Or save himself from the power of the grave, young and old, good and bad, rich and poor. No gender is spared, no person is exempt. Ecclesiastes 8.8 says, No one has power over the day of his death. (laughs) The genius, the rich, the poor, no one outruns it, no one outsmarts it. Julius Caesar died. John Lennon died. Elvis Presley died. Princess Diana died. We we all die. Nearly two people a second. More than 6,000 people an hour. 155,000 every day. About 57 million people die each year. We all die. No matter what you do. The finest surgeon might enhance your life, but he cannot eliminate your death. Pop all the pills you want. Eat all the green vegetables you can take. Stay out of the sun. Stay away from alcohol and tobacco. You might improve the quality of your life, but you never eliminate the inevitability of death. Isn't that a bummer? We just die. Or do we? Or do we? What if this is just the first day? What what if this is just the first chapter of our... What if this is just the first sentence of the first chapter of our... What if this is just the first word of the first sentence? What if this is just the first letter of the first word of the first chapter of the story that God is writing with our lives? What if we're just getting started? This is the promise of Easter. Easter. It was Sunday morning after the Friday execution. The executioners were confident that they had done their work. The spear to the side of Christ had made certain that Jesus' final breath was his final breath. And that final breath seemed to suck the air out of the universe. And as his body lay a molder and in the grave, no one was placing bets on a resurrection. The only concern of the soldiers was those pesky disciples. The religious leaders were concerned too. In fact, they went to Pilate and they said, 
So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. Well, as we know, no concern was necessary. The disciples, they were at meltdown. All the disciples forsook him and fled, the Bible says. Peter followed him for a while from a distance, but then he caved in and cursed Christ. John, the beloved disciple, followed Christ all the way to the cross and witnessed the crucifixion. But there is no indication that John, even John, was expecting a resurrection. And the other disciples, they were hiding in every available corner and cupboard in Jerusalem for fear of a cross that bore their name. On Saturday night, the enemy had won, it seemed. Hope caught the last train to the coast. And when the women came on Sunday morning, they did not come to talk to Jesus in the cemetery. They came to embalm the body of Jesus in the cemetery. But God had other plans, for that's when God rocked the cemetery. There was a violent earthquake. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning. His clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and they became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified, but he is not here. He is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where his body lay. The earth shook. There was a violent earthquake. Pebbles tumbled. Boulders fell. The ground shook and the women struggled to keep their balance because the ground was shaking. They looked in the direction of the tomb and there were the guards. And the guards were scared stiff, paralyzed, sprawled out on the ground. They had the appearance of dead men. Ironic, don't you think? Their job was to guard a dead man. Now they look dead. And the dead man they're guarding is apparently alive. And an angel has descended from heaven. And that morning he took a seat on the rock. It says that, does it not? He sat on the stone. He dislodged it and then he sat on it. I don't know what angels are supposed to do in a moment like this. But I just don't, I just never thought that he would sit down. Do angels take a seat? I guess they do. I guess I thought the angel would have been standing, defiant, extending his wings, flexing his pecs, showing off. But instead of that, he just thought, well, I think I'll just sit down, take a seat. Cross his legs. <laughs> I don't know if he whistled. I don't know if he crossed his legs. But I do know this. It fell to the angel to make the Easter announcement. He has risen. He has risen. It takes us three words in English. It's just one word in Greek. Here it is. Egerthe. Say it with me. Egerthe. One more time. Agarthe. When Matthew originally wrote this story, that is the word he wrote. Agarthe. It descends from a family of words which means to awaken. Odd word to use in a cemetery, right? We think of a cemetery as a place to go to sleep. But the angel says, oh, he has risen. He has awakened. So much relies upon the validity of this Agarthe. If this egarthe is a joke, if it is a hoax, then all of Christianity collapses like a poorly told joke. And millions upon millions of us have followed a pied piper blindly over a cliff. But if it is true, if Jesus is risen, if this egarthe is real, 
then you can believe this, that Jesus descended into the coldest cell of death's prison and he allowed the warden to lock the door and smelt the keys in a furnace. And just when the demons began to dance and just when the demons began to prance, Jesus pressed his pierced hands against the inner walls of the cavern and from deep within the cave of death, he shook the cemetery and the ground began to rumble and the tombstones tumbled and out he marched. The cadaver turned king with the mask of death in one hand and the keys of life in the other, and all of heaven announced, Egerthe. He has risen. Not risen from sleep. Not risen from slumber. Not risen from stupor. Not risen from confusion. Not spiritually raised. But physically raised. The women and the disciples did not see a phantom. They didn't experience a sentiment. They saw Jesus and Jesus assured them, It is I myself. On the road to Emmaus, the two disciples to whom Jesus appeared, they saw a pilgrim just like they. They didn't know who he was at first, but they didn't think he was a ghost. His feet touched the ground. He didn't levitate as he walked. His hands broke bread. When Mary saw Jesus in the garden, she thought he was a, does anyone remember? A gardener. He looked so common. When Thomas touched the wounds, his hand did not go through the body of Christ. His hands touched flesh. Jesus was raised in a body of flesh, the very body in which he had been born, the very body that carried him through Galilee and Jerusalem now came walking out of the grave. Handle me and see, he told people. Handle me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. Now why was he so insistent? And why is this so important? Well, the bodily resurrection means everything. If Jesus is just raised in our memory, if he just lives on in our hearts, well, he's no, more, he's no different than my grandma or my aunt who lives on in my memory, who lives on in my heart, but her body is buried or his body is buried. He's no different than a thousand and one martyrs who have come and gone but left a legacy behind them. But if he is bodily raised, as the scriptures teach, that means that right now in the very heart of heaven, in the holiest place in the universe, he indwells a physical body of flesh and bones and oversees all the affairs of history and issues this promise that what God did with his grave, God will do with yours. And what God did with his body, God will do with yours. He will resurrect it. He will turn it into an immortal force that will reign and rule with him forever. Beginning of the story, you better believe it. End of the story, no way. He takes what you think is your final chapter and he turns it into a preface. Just the start. Yes, we're all going to face death unless Christ comes first. But we will not face it alone. And we need not face it in fear. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And he who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe in Jesus? then you will never die. Oh, your body might cease. You may pass through a time of transition, but you will never, never die. What a remarkable discovery. Everybody on earth is telling you how to improve the quality of this life, but only Jesus Christ comes to you with a solution for your grave. That's what sets him apart and makes him worthy of our service. The most amazing thing happened 
as I was working on this very page of this very message. I typically keep keep my email alert turned off while I'm studying. You're probably uh, not as ADD as I am. But I get easily distracted in an unbroken train of thought is difficult to find. So to pursue a train of thought, I keep the email alert turned off because every time it beeps, I just have to turn. I cannot ignore it. That afternoon, I thought I had turned it off, but I had not. And I was on this very paragraph when I received an email alert. And I turned to see who sent me an email. Of all things, a friend of mine in Nashville, Tennessee, had just left a funeral. Here I'm writing a sermon on death, and he had just left a funeral. And he wanted to tell me about the funeral of his 96-year-old aunt, Aunt Wanda. Here's what he said. Max, until about a year ago, you couldn't keep up with my Aunt Wanda. Seriously, she had such energy, you just couldn't believe it. Her eyesight was failing so completely that energy almost made it dangerous to go to unfamiliar places with her. Her eyes couldn't see the crack in the sidewalk that she was about to trot over at 90 miles an hour. About a year ago, she started having difficulty breathing. The doctor found a mass in her chest that was almost certainly cancer. But at 95, there was little reason to do surgery, even exploratory. The better plan was to keep her comfortable. But it was only in the last three days of her life that the mass became so painful that she needed medication to fight the pain. It became so severe so quickly that she was given enough morphine to sedate her and basically keep her in an unconscious state. But as she began to pass from this life into the next, her sight became clear and she was released of pain. Even in her unconscious state, she began to have conversations with those who had gone before her. She saw her mother, who was her best friend, and she talked to her. In my favorite part, she saw my dad and their brother. My dad and their brother, Uncle Marvin, were constantly playing practical jokes on her, on Aunt Wanda. And she was always referring to them as those boys. I have no idea what they did or how they greeted her at heaven's door, but whatever it was made her laugh so hard that she literally pulled her legs up to her chest and she doubled over laughing. Oh, I can't believe you boys, she said. Oh my goodness, you boys. And she literally took her last breath laughing. I can't wait to find out what she saw. But it must have been something grand. I can't wait to find out what you're going to see. But it will be something grand. Will you die laughing? I don't know. But my friend, I can assure you of this. You will die in peace. If you are in Christ... If you have entrusted your soul and heart to him, then the one who defeated death will defeat yours. And the one who inspired King David to write these words, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. For your rod and your staff, they comfort me. He will meet you, and he will walk you through the valley of the shadow of death. But what if you never entrust your soul to Christ? And I know we have people here who have not. What if you never do? What if for some reason you say, well, I guess I'll just face death on my own? Well, then you will. You'll face death all alone with no shepherd to guide you, no Savior to save you for eternity. Why, for heaven's sake, would you do that? Why would you do that? 
You can say yes to Jesus today. No one can do it for you, but no one can keep you from doing it. You can say yes to Jesus. And when you do, the last day of your life becomes the best day of your life. If that's not the oddest thing. And what everyone else fears is maybe not what you want yet, but you don't dread it either. Winston Churchill planned his own funeral. He left instructions for two buglers to be positioned high in the dome of St. Paul's Cathedral. And at the conclusion of his funeral service, the first bugler played the song Taps. The song that signals the end of the day. But the second bugler with the sound of taps still ringing in the dome, began to play Reveille, the song of a day begun. That's a good funeral song for the Christian. Because in the hands of Christ, the cemetery becomes the place where, not where we go to die, but it's really the place from which we'll be called to live. We wake up. Agathe, we are awakened. He has risen. And death is no longer the domain of the grim reaper, but it becomes the domain of the soul keeper. And death is not a crisis, it's just a corner. It, it's not a pit, it's just a passageway. Because we know that someday God will say words like these. Your dead will live. Your corpses will get to their feet. All you dead and buried, wake up and sing. Your dew is morning dew, catching the first rays of sun. And the earth is bursting with life, giving birth to the dead. So play on, bugler. Play on. The same God who raised his son from the dead will raise you from the same. And the same God who emptied that grave will empty yours. And the same God who shook that cemetery will shake them all. Eggerthay, he is risen.